I want to watch this. How North Korea helped the greatest pro wrestling event in history. I'm Kento Bento. Pyongyang, North Korea, 1995. The lone American made his way down a long, dingy hallway past. Okay, it's not gonna be two hours. This is a 20 minute video. Okay, I'll be back in one second. North Korean officials. He was nervous, afraid of what was to come. Not just because of the constant surveillance he was under, but the state of the entire country. You see, North Korea at that very moment was in the midst of a devastating famine, with hundreds and thousands of its citizens suffering and dying from starvation and illnesses. He didn't know what to expect, but he was there for a reason, and he had a job to do. At the entrance, he got his cue, and with one final breath, he stepped out into what was a sea of humanity. Now this wasn't just any crowd, this was 190,000 North Koreans who were conditioned to see Americans as evil, who did not know pro wrestling was staged, that it was predetermined and choreographed. And here was a man, a blonde haired American man, who embodied everything they were legitimately told to hate. This man, you may have heard of, was the legendary Ric Flair, one of the greatest American professional wrestlers of all time. And at this moment, he was wondering what he had gotten himself into. Now this happened in April 1995, but the events that led to this actually started 11 months earlier. Tokyo, Japan, 1994. Over a thousand kilometers away, a Japanese politician was in his office contemplating his uncertain future. This politician was in the midst of a major scandal involving his alleged connection to the Japanese mafia, the Yakuza, and this seriously threatened his upcoming re-election to the House of Councillors, Japan's equivalent to the US Senate. Now, aside from being a politician, he was also one of the most popular Japanese wrestlers of all time, because this man with the granite chin was the renowned Antonio Inoki. Initially rising to fame as the protege of the great 1950s legend Ricky Dozan, the first real megastar of Japanese pro wrestling, he eventually branched out building a legacy of his own, later parlaying his in-ring success and popularity to the world of politics. However, with his political career now in limbo, he was thinking of leveraging that past to save his future. Now over in the Hermit Kingdom, an incident was taking place, something unthinkable. The great leader, the eternal president, the founder of North Korea, Kim Il-sung, had collapsed. He was having a heart attack. A team of North Korea's best doctors were flown in to save him. They worked on him for hours. So what's up? Is that a part of the fucking plot line? But alas, on the afternoon of July 8th, 1994, Kim Il-sung died. To North Koreans, this was a man who saved Korea, who single-handedly defeated the evil Japanese to liberate the nation, who fought off and vanquished the imperialist Americans to win the Korean War. And those were some mighty shoes to fill. His son, Kim Jong-il, now left suddenly with an entire nation to rule and one under immense turmoil felt this pressure, as all eyes were on him. Meanwhile- I love people saying R.I.P. Bozo. <laughs> bro, we smoking that, that Kim Il-sung pack, bro. <laughs> chin chin go back you must see the chin yeah i did dude he's got fucking giga j uh giga chad jaw god damn pack watch One of the two Michaels jailed in China would kick it and chill with Kim. Dude. Dude, I'm sorry, but calling them the two Michaels is like, that was a terrible branding decision by, that was a terrible branding decision by Canada, okay? Like, it's it just like, no matter what happens, like, I can't take it seriously. I'm sorry. For chat that doesn't know what that is, there are two Michaels that were, uh, that are currently in prison in China, right? Like, and it just sounds so stupid, like, but they keep calling them the two Michaels.
like in an effort to not make it sound dumb it's michael spavner and michael kovrig they have been arrested and they're they've been detained by the chinese government the two canadian men that were taking into custody in the people's republic of china And every time they talk about them, like every time they talk about them in the debates, they were like the two Michaels. They kept saying, they kept saying the Michaels, the two Michaels. And I feel like it just made it, it just made it worse. Twenty-four, <sighs> Kim Il-sung died. To North Koreans, this was a man who saved Korea, who single-handedly defeated the evil Japanese to liberate the nation, who fought off and vanquished the imperialist Americans to win the Korean War. And those were some mighty shoes to fill. His son, Kim Jong-il, now left suddenly with an entire nation to rule and one under immense turmoil felt this pressure, as all eyes were on him. Meanwhile, in the US, there was one company that was reigning supreme as the world's premier wrestling brand, the Connecticut-based World Wrestling Federation, or WWF, today known as the WWE. Now, at the time, their biggest competitor was the Georgia-based World Championship Wrestling, or WCW, who was constantly trying to play catch-up. This frustrated the WCW president, Eric Bischoff, who wanted nothing more than to beat his rival. One night, Bischoff received a call from an old Japanese acquaintance. It was the wrestler turned politician, Antonio Inoki. Inoki had finally figured out how to save his political career, and it, perhaps strangely, involved holding the greatest pro wrestling event the world had ever seen. Okay, this is the most insane concept. I'm already, I'm hooked. Dude, I love, I, I love psycho shit like this, bro. This is so, it's so nuts. Inoki himself owned a successful wrestling company in Tokyo called New Japan Pro Wrestling, NJPW, and in a collaborative effort with Bischoff's WCW, wanted to put on a pay-per-view extravaganza with marquee names from both sides of the Pacific. The publicity would be huge. Bischoff listened intently as Inoki revealed the one caveat. The event would be held in North Korea, the totalitarian, isolationist Why? state. Now, this in itself would be controversial, but NJPW was a Japanese company and WCW was an American company, two countries considered the greatest of enemies to North Korea. Despite this, Inoki was willing, hoping the publicity and goodwill gleaned from this so-called world peace event, as he dubbed it, would boost his chances at re-election, as well as help put the- Bro, how did that guy not win every election just by looking the way he does though? Like, I just don't understand. He's, he just looks like a giga chat. I would just vote for him just on that. WCW on the map, or at least that was his pitch to Bischoff. Bischoff like, look, let me tell you something, okay? When they're recreating you, when they're recreating you, your likeness as a cartoon, and they make your jaw larger than the fucking phone. Like, you know you're doing something right. To Bischoff. Bischoff didn't actually need much convincing though because he saw this as a phenomenal opportunity to gain mainstream attention. Now, of course, all this really amounts to nothing if North Korea didn't actually agree to hold the event. And for such an isolationist country intent on keeping outsiders away, this just wasn't going to happen, barring, of course, some- He converted to Islam and changed his name to Mohammed Hussein Inoki. You are such a liar, no Unprecedented shot. event that would change the course of North Korea. Which it did. The supreme leader had died, and his son Kim Jong-il was now ruler, which meant he needed what? to make a statement. He needed to showcase his newfound power and influence to the world and to his own people. He needed to prove his worth and establish a cult of personality he felt was vital for political control, something he learned from dad. And, odd as it may seem to us, a grand pro wrestling event with its simplistic portrayals of good and evil 
apparently served that purpose. North Korea had always tended towards these types of old-fashioned Stalinist spectacles in showcasing their might. And so, he was on board. Thus, the pieces were now in place. Enoki, Bischoff, and Kim were all in. But they needed a main event to headline the show, one that would generate a great deal of buzz. And it only made sense that Enoki himself be involved given his superstar status, which he agreed to. Being semi-retired from the sport by that point and being an active high-profile politician made it unexpected to some, though not completely unique in the annals of wrestling history as seen by current mayor of Knox County, Tennessee, Kane, who still <laughs> makes in ring- <laughs> Dude, I know. Dude, there's a lot of wrestlers that actually became like politicians. It's like not alone. You got the body, brother. You know, he's not alone. Kane is not the only one. That's right. I'm Jesse the Body Venturin. Let me tell you something before I was on. Oh, I'm fucking it up a little bit. I'm fucking that it up. It's like. Before I was a part of the. I, ah, sounds like Michael Pillow. appearances to this day. Inoki had always taken a, shall we say, hands-on approach in diplomatic affairs, and controversies aside, his actions have often stemmed from a genuine interest in promoting world peace, to the point of putting- Let me tell you something, she should apologize to me! When he's referencing uh, Chris Kyle's uh, recently widowed wife. That's right. That is true himself in some real danger. Now, the question was though, who was he going to face in the main event? His opponent also had to be someone big, and preferably American, and so Eric Bischoff went and asked his biggest star in WCW to join him in Pyongyang. The most famous wrestler of all time. Wait, Hulk Hogan was WCW? So, oh, okay, so Hulk Hogan precedes, or predates uh, WWE. Because I thought Hulk Hogan was... Hulk Hogan, who said no. But who did agree to join him was the nature boy, Ric Flair, also one of the all-time greats. Unlike Hogan, party boy Flair was always up for an adventure and was excited to take the risk. And a risk it was, as once inside the Hermit Kingdom, no one would be able to guarantee their safety. Now, at this point, the powers that be wanted even more prestige added to the event. So they called upon a name that even non-wrestling fans would have heard of. Astonishingly, Bischoff was able to convince Muhammad Ali the Greatest to join them on the ride. Many months later- This is where the Muhammad Ali uh, uh, Japanese dude fight happened? In North Korea? Oh my fucking god, dude. Pyongyang, this is the most this motley insane. crew of high profile American- dude, This is a top 10 anime crossover, dude. This is so crazy. What? Oh no, that, that was earlier in Japan? Oh, okay, got Japanese it. wrestlers and performers touched down in a special military plane sent by the North Korean government. They were warned in advance the plane would be bugged, bugged. Filled, filled with microphones, microphones, which meant they had to refrain from saying anything even remotely negative about the country. Upon landing, each person had their passports taken and was immediately assigned a handler by North Korea's intelligence agency to follow them around 24-7. This meant they weren't allowed to go anywhere except for on carefully curated tours of the country crafted specifically for them. On these tours, they had to go to monuments and memorials where they were told by their handlers that the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki never happened. Wait, what? And that Why? North Korea won World War II. Oh, that's strange. I did not know that as an enthusiast. I did not know that they just like fucking deny that. That's, <laughs> that's weird. Two, many times they had to pay their respects to the great heroes of North Korea's past, including of course, the recently deceased Supreme Leader. All in all, they were simply the best. And if anyone told them otherwise, there would be severe consequences. So what's up, how many, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wonder if Ric Flair took his dick out in North Korea. I'm willing to bet he didn't, you know what I mean? I'm willing to bet he didn't bust his cock out as, and do his uh, notorious helicopter move. Pepe, Le oh no. Are you serious? No, he didn't, dude. There's no shot he did the fucking helicopter. They would, I feel like they would literally jail him. They would just lock him up if that happened. 
circumstances. One of the wrestlers, Big Scott Norton, found this out the hard way. One night in his hotel room, he was on the phone with his wife, who was in the US. They were arguing, as she was accusing him of partying recklessly, having a blast with the guys over in Asia. Norton tried to explain that she was wrong, that that sort of thing just wasn't possible in North Korea. Uh -oh. But she didn't believe him. Out of frustration, he yelled, you don't understand what kind of shit we're in, which is when the phone went dead. The door suddenly opened and North Korean military personnel came in and forced him out. They sat him down in an interrogation room and informed him that he can't talk about their country like that. Indeed, they had heard everything. The phone was tapped and the room was bugged. All the hotel rooms were under surveillance. According to his later account, Norton fully expected to be shot right then, right there. But as things were looking dire, someone high up in command walked in and after some vague threats and a stern warning, he was let go. Perhaps it was because they knew a high profile diplomatic incident would likely be more detrimental to North Korea. Or they just didn't want to ruin the big event the next day, as Scott Norton was a featured attraction. Either way, come event time, Norton Flair, all the wrestlers were ready to put on a show. Now, there was a huge famine going on, and so the wrestlers really had no idea what sort of crowd to expect. Would they even be able to afford tickets? But upon arrival at the stadium, they were shocked to find a packed attendance. North Koreans are literally just stands for the stands? No, they're just, they stand North Korea. Which in itself is impressive. But this was North Korea's May Day Stadium. To this day, the largest stadium in the world. Ric Flair was ecstatic that there were real draws even in the Hermit Kingdom, but he was soon informed that what he was witnessing was a forced attendance. North Korea wanted to show the world how much they were truly respected, and it was clear that empty arena matches just wouldn't convey that. As for their militaristic might, they had tanks and launchers displayed on the field, as well as lots and lots and lots of marching. In the back, I 100% buy the story, but I could also see him just hanging up on his wife and saying that that's what happened when he got home. No shot. I'm sure they fucking did that shit, dude. Come on. Like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of Western, uh, like, uh, there's a lot of, uh, exaggerations from the West about what's going on in North Korea. But like, that is some shit that definitely happened. Like, they care about the aesthetics a lot. Okay. Everything I've seen and everything I've read about North Korea from better sources than just like, you know, the BBC or whatever shows me that like they love the leadership loves western culture they're like me they're amiraboos okay 1000 percent. and they also get like i mean all the fucking sons like they get uh they go to school in like switzerland and shit okay can you stop being a chauvinist they're starving but went to the stadium so much propaganda jesus christ can you stop being a chauvinist vice your source what? I, I don't understand why people stand for North Korea this way. Like, I, I really don't understand. Like, they don't care about you, okay? It's just not... Like, I'll never understand it. It's like, dude, you're so stupid. Like, I, I very routinely shit on even, like, defectors that fucking, uh, you know, use their experiences, like, in exaggerated accounts of their experiences to be, like, SJW culture in America is just like fucking North Korea, dumb shit like that. I talk about how America's impact on North Korea is significantly more devastating than, like, it being a theocratic monarchy, basically. But, like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be like, Jusha is a... Is, uh, the the final extension of scientific Marxism and uh, an ideology revolving around self-reliance. And that's precisely why North Korea is in the situation it's in. And it's actually wonderful. And they're eating burgers every day. Like, why, why can't you be normal, man? Why? Like, why can't you be normal? Just be normal, dude. Like, America has the world's largest, like, prison slave population, okay? Is it really that far off to assume that a fucking theocratic monarchy like North Korea would, would not have fucking prison camps and mass surveillance? We have mass surveillance. Why the fuck wouldn't they?
think there's a big difference between being a DPRK stan and not believing propaganda. I mean, I don't believe in uh, the propaganda either. I, I talk against the propaganda, but there is some, but it, it's wild to me to assume that like, you know, North Korea doesn't have fucking uh, gulags or, or labor camps just like we do. And that also on top of that, like they're engaging in mass surveillance of the people that come into North Korea. North Korea literally rejects Marxist Leninism. It's in their constitution. How is North Korea a theocracy? Which God do they worship? The fucking family. The Kim Il Sung, Kim Jong Un, Kim Jong Il. That's who they worship. They worship Kim, the Kim family. In North Korea, they worship the Kim family. In America, we worship the Kim Kardashian family. Oh! There you go. That was a that was a joke. Okay. They had rows of children holding up sectioned cards that collectively depicted ballistic missiles hitting the US and Japan, which, while a magnificent sight to behold, was awkwardly worrisome for the American and Japanese wrestlers who were getting ready to perform. Now once they were performing, once the actual wrestling started, things took a strange turn. Because it became quickly apparent that something wasn't quite right. The entire stadium of people were silent eerily silent. Pro wrestling had always been contingent on eliciting crowd reactions and playing off that, so this was a huge detriment to the performance. Now, it turned out that likely no one in the stadium actually knew what pro wrestling was. They didn't know any of the famous wrestlers, and they didn't know it was meant to be fake. For this conservative crowd, the carnivalesque glitz and glamour, the flamboyance and face paint was just too much. And if anything- Bro, can you imagine like only consuming North Korean media? your entire life and then bam they just hit you in the face with like america's most insane soap opera like bro i'm fucking turkish and an Amerabu, and to me wrestling is psychotic and i'm 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 30 years old i have as an Amerabu, consumed so much american culture my entire upbringing I've lived here and even to me, even wrestling now is like insane. I can't even comprehend what it looks like when you're, <laughs> when you go from like no Western media whatsoever to like the most American thing you can watch. It's like having a monster truck rally, dude. It's like, they're like, Hey, we're going to host a monster truck rally in the middle of fucking Pyongyang. <laughs> Just like... Monday, Monday, Monday! <laughs> they were expecting competition along the lines of amateur wrestling, or Greco-Roman, the best fighting the best, true gladiators, the, the elite, not the suspiciously fake stuff. But that wasn't even the biggest problem because the entire show was filled with American and Japanese wrestlers. All the matches were either America versus America, Japan versus Japan, or America versus Japan. So who are they supposed to cheer? Wrestling's meant to have a good guy, bad guy dynamic, and they clearly established at the start who not to cheer for. The definite- Yeah, it's like, it's like two enemies going off against each other. Who the fuck would they? Like, who, who are they supposed to root for in that situation? The both of the bad guys. <laughs> That is kind of funny. King silence continued through Two Cold Scorpio's breakdancing, the Steiner Brothers' theatrics, and even some solid wrestling. Wait, they filmed this? We have to watch the movies. I have to watch, like, the, the raw footage, dude. There were a few exceptions, though, that provoked a reaction, like the women's tag match, which was absolutely shocking for the North Korean men, Bull Nakano in particular, with the blue-haired dominatrix look, and the match of behemoths. Big Scott Norton, fresh from interrogation, battling Shinya Hashimoto. Big heavyset men like these were, of course, bewildering sights in a country ravaged by famine. Exceptions aside, though, by and large, there were no reactions. The crowd just didn't care. And as the main event rolled around, things were looking grim. Ric Flair versus Antonio Inoki. Once again, America versus Japan. Now, Flair may have been on edge, but Inoki, well, he wasn't concerned because he had a plan. In fact, he had anticipated the crowd from the very start. 
and as the architect of this whole affair, he was banking on one very important piece of the puzzle. One that was remarkably over 70 years in the making. Hongwon County, North Korea, 1924, on the East Coast. There was a boy who was the son of a farmer. He grew up poor like many in the region, but once older, he was able to make his way to Japan to earn a living. Korea was still under colonial Japanese rule at the time. He first did sumo, but soon gave it up to try his hand at professional wrestling. This is where he found unrivaled success, defeating American after American, emerging as a folk hero to the Japanese people. In the post-war era, the Japanese people were searching for that one symbol of strength, a symbol of Japanese resurgence, and they found it in this man, the man known as Riki Dozan, the first real megastar of Japanese pro wrestling. By this point, he was a naturalized Japanese, but he still loved his homeland and its people, if not the regime running it. Then in 1963, after an altercation at a nightclub, to the shock of the nation, he unexpectedly died. Now, it was at this point, North Korea decided to use him, an ethnic North Korean, for propaganda purposes, transferring his legacy to fit the North Korean narrative, defeating American after American on behalf of the Kim regime, even if no one in the country knew what pro wrestling was. Today, he stands as the nation's ultimate anti-imperialist patriot, and just like the Kims, is a revered national hero, heavily featured in North Korean media, propaganda posters, monuments, with people all over the country traveling to pay their respects. He was murdered with a piss-soaked sword? What the fuck, why? Which is why 30 odd years after his death, it was a monumental occasion when Ricky Dozan's protege, Antonio Inoki, on behalf of his mentor, returned to the homeland to once again conquer and defeat an imperialist American scoundrel. As Flair made his way to the ring, looking as American as can be, with his blonde hair, blue eyes, and star-studded robe, he was nervous. The crowd was treating him with a sense of quiet disdain. But then it was time for Inoki's entrance. He came out. And for the first time, the crowd came alive. It didn't matter that he was Japanese, because he was representing the great Riki Doza. It was a Yakuza plan murder, probably a racist attack. There's a lot of Korea phobia in Japan. Vice versa. He's the North Korean Rocky. Yeah. As the match started, it became very clear that this wasn't America versus Japan. This was America versus North Korea. We hear the crowd for one of the few times at Collision in Korea really responding to Anoki. The people truly loved Anoki, chanting his name and hanging on his every move. Flair too played his part well with his classic cowardly antics. And after about 15 minutes of back and forth action, Inoki nailed a cartwheel kick, a devastating top rope knee drop, and finally, his signature and Zaguri kick. You think there was a little Korean boy in there going, pulling his mom's uh, robe and being like, hey yo, they're not hitting each other. <laughs> what the fuck, ma? Yo, we got scam, ma? the fuck is this? <laughs> and it was over. The hero had triumphed. Fans stood up and applauded as North Korea once again prevailed. The main event was a success. Kim was happy, and with the entire event in Pyongyang having a legitimate record-breaking attendance, far greater than any WrestleMania to date, this was proclaimed undoubtedly the greatest pro wrestling event in history. Or was it? That was the North Korean narrative. But outside of the Hermit Kingdom, the event actually failed to garner any real publicity. That's no kind of wild. Like, how the fuck did it get no publicity, dude? <laughs> like, this is like such an... <coughs> this is such an insanely spectacular event of epic magnitudes. One knew about it, and the few who did... Keep chewing that nicotine gum to keep calm? What? Hey, calm, Hossie. Reported it as some strange. Dude. My sanest hater chat. Yeah, I do know the guy in the ring murdered his family. Uh, Benoit. We haven't watched it yet, but yeah, we will eventually. Strange attempt to win world respect. Reinforcing international opinion that North Korea was kind of weird. Kim Jong-il did not get the respect he was seeking, but it wasn't just him. After returning to Japan. Dude, this is content. I mean, this is actually content. I want to see him. He's like desperately trying to get a rise out of me, but I want to. 
I want to it's, like, did... it's backfiring. Discovered that the event offered little to no political rub amidst its controversies, and a few months later, he lost his re-election bid to Japan's House of Councillors. For Eric Bischoff, he decided to air the controversial event on pay-per-view, marketing it as Collision in Korea, which hopefully was have, the big I push have, he needed uh, to once and the Gabby case yesterday. for all topple the WWF. But it tanked. The ratings were low, and no one cared. There wasn't even any blowback for their time in Korea. Years later, WCW was purchased by the WWF, by this point, the WWE, and the event soon faded Aww. into obscurity. Now, interestingly, this wasn't actually the last time a major US wrestling company would go on to hold a prominent event in a controversial totalitarian state. Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, 2018. 23 years after North Korea. The WWE, now unrivaled as the world's largest wrestling promotion, held an event in the kingdom's capital. This amidst controversy involving the journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who after being surveilled for weeks by Saudi officials, was executed in the Saudi consulate in Turkey. According to many sources, the order came from the crown prince himself, although Saudi Arabia denies this. The show went on despite criticisms from prominent politicians, the media, political commentators, and even WWE's top stars, like Daniel Bryan and John Cena, who refused to work the event. All this- God damn, John Cena. John Cena is like, when you lose John Cena, it's over, bro. John Zena. It's quite unlike North Korea, where no one cared. However, just like North Korea, the Saudi show inextricably featured a wrestler turned politician who, like Anoki, just so happened to compete in the night's main event. An uncanny coincidence. This man, the aforementioned mayor of Knox County, Tennessee, Kane. Now, the funny thing is, while North Korea was spying on wrestlers, Saudi Arabia was spying on journalists, tapping their phones and hacking their accounts, which makes it all the more fitting that the only reason they were caught and exposed was because Turkey was spying on them. And really, it's not just governments or journalists or wrestlers. Most people today are too laxed when it comes to online security. Oh my God, a segue. He's doing a segue. He's doing it. Oh, that's a good one. I call it. Hey, if you like this video, please subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. <laughs>